So we're gonna go a ways back today, back to the 1760s. So for those of you that don't know your Canadian history very well, in 1763, this Treaty of Paris was signed, and it's because the British, after many, many years of fighting back and forth with the French in Canada, finally beat the French, and the French surrendered and said, alright, we give up, Britain, Canada is yours. However, France wasn't actually asked to leave, and colonies existed, as you well know. Where it becomes tricky is that the First Nations living in Canada, at least over in what is now Ontario and Quebec, favored terms with the French over the British, mostly because the, the French preferred to rent land from the First Nations groups, where the British usually liked to do sort of a one-time fee and insisted that they had bought the land. Now this turns into huge problems that exist straight through until today, where the British system said, okay, we're paying you under the understanding that we are buying this land. The French preferred the system of giving out lavish presents and gifts, and renting the land, as it were. And obviously, once the French were defeated, defeated by the British, the First Nations groups in the area started to go, well, we might need to start doing things differently here. Enter a famous Ottawa Ojibwa chief by the name of Pontiac. Now, despite being a distinguished warrior, very little is actually known about him, but what we do know is that he was not liking the situation that was unfolding after the Treaty of Paris, and for good reason. Now Pontiac wisely sees that with the British winning over the French, all of a sudden British settlers were going to start a massive push into their territories and begin settling them, which had already started to occur. So Pontiac managed to convince a bunch of the other nations in the Great Lakes region to mount a massive campaign to push the settlers back. And after about a year of planning or so, these uh, ambushes and attacks actually started to occur and Pontiac's uprising, or Pontiac's rebellion as it's sometimes known, began. Now it's important at this point to remember that at this moment in time, in the 1760s, the whole idea of a colonial government and, and British control was shaky at best. These were isolated little settlements that existed, and certainly there was a military presence. But settlers were just going out on their own and forming new settlements, and all, I mean, all of it was on native land, essentially. So the First Nations in the area had a very legitimate concern that settlers were all of a sudden moving into their area and to their territory and no fees had actually been paid, no transactions or agreements had actually occurred. So I'm not trying to paint the British as antagonistic jerks, although some of them were. Nor am I trying to make the French sound like complete saints, because they certainly weren't and they exploited the First Nations in the area as well. What I'm trying to do though is position the idea that Pontiac had very serious and very legitimate concerns about the British winning the war and taking over Canada. And I'll get to that in a second. So Pontiac's army at its height only numbered about 900 men. Now up against the British army you might think, well they were snuffed out immediately. Huh, not so. They were actually quite successful and took over a number of forts and garrisons and settlements in the sort of uh, lower Ontario, Ontario kind of upper United States portion. And um, the most famous incident was actually at uh, Mishamilamackinac, which was a, a fort where uh, they for staged a lacrosse game outside of the fort. And when the ball went over the garrison walls and the soldiers were like, okay, come on, come in, get your ball, the First Nations Army rushed in, took over the fort, and things like that were how they were quite successful at first in beginning to push back the British settlers and the British army. So Pontiac's army is steaming ahead, making all of this progress. Why would you give that up? Well, first of all, winter was coming. The First Nations in the area knew that they had to start resuming the fur trade and get on with basic subsistence activities. Otherwise, you know, they would just die in the winter. So there was nece it was necessary to go back into industry and into things that were providing for themselves. Makes sense, right? 
Also at play was at Fort Detroit, a powerful chief in the area, the most powerful chief in the area, Wabi Kamakot, was a good friend to the British, and he came to the aid of the, the British at Fort Detroit, and actually managed to overturn Pontiac's forces. An appointed chief of Indian Affairs decides to oversee a treaty negotiation. Pontiac is talked into a truce and agrees to certain terms. So the peace terms became known as the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which sounds very official and, and quite nice, really. Here's one of the terms. The several nations or tribes of Indians with whom we are connected and who live under our protection should not be molested or disturbed in the possession of such parts of our dominions and territories as, not having been ceded to or purchased by us, are reserved to them or any of them as their hunting grounds. There's another part. It says that no governor or commander-in-chief in any of our colonies or plantations in America do presume for the present and until further pleasure be known to grant warrants of survey or pass patents for any lands beyond the heads or any sources of any rivers that fall into the Atlantic Ocean, etc, etc, etc. You can see a pattern here. Basically, the British government signed a royal proclamation that said they would not encroach on First Nations territory. So, why bother with Pontiac? Ultimately, he uh, signed a peace treaty and the uprising was quelled. Who cares? Well, we care because it was another in a long line of incidences in Canada where rebellion and uprising was involved. As we've seen in other videos and we've talked about, the whole notion of a peaceful Canada and there never being any civil wars, while that may be true there was never any grand civil war like in America, we certainly had our fair share of problems. And when you're looking at issues uh, regarding First Nations territories, importantly, we have documents like the Royal Proclamation of 1763 that say very explicitly, these lands have not been sold or ceded to us, and we must negotiate first in order to purchase these lands. So what was the final result of the Royal Proclamation of 1763? Well, surprise! No one really cared. It was a piece of paper without any teeth, and colonial governments loved to operate in terms of pieces of paper and drafting up these various laws. But ultimately, in the end, it had very little effect. Settlers kept encroaching on native lands, and basically the government, or the provisional government at the time, turned a blind eye to it and really didn't do much to help out their so-called First Nations allies. So that kind of sucks, and it kind of ends on a depressing note. But what about Pontiac? Well, we don't really know. We never knew much about him in the first place. Uh, we know he was kind of born somewhere around 1720, and we know he was a famous war chief, and we know, of course, about his uprising. But we actually don't know much about what happened to him afterwards. If this is not true and you know something, then you should post comments below and let me know and set me right. Anyway, that's the story of Pontiac's uprising. Read things, it's good for you. <laughs>